Well, a warm welcome to you today again at uh, my channel. And uh, today I want to continue in the series on the Spirit of Christ. And I want to speak to you today specifically on the newness of the Spirit. I want to start off with Romans 7 verse 6. It says, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Galatians 5 verse 18 tells us, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You see, the work of the indwelling Spirit of God is to glorify Christ and to reveal Christ within us. This corresponds to the threefold office of Christ of prophet, of priest, and of king. And we find that the work of the indwelling Spirit in the believer is therefore also set before us in three aspects, as being enlightening, sanctifying, and strengthening. Jesus spoke in his farewell discourse of the enlightening when he promises the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth, we will bear witness of him and will guide us into all truth and will take the fullness of Christ, that which belongs to Christ, and then declare it into us. In the epistles to the Romans and the Galatians, we see his work as being sanctified, and in that it is especially prominent. This is what was needed in the churches that were just brought out of the depths of paganism. In the epistles to the Corinthians, where wisdom was so sought and prized, we see the two aspects are then combined, and that they are taught that the Spirit can only enlighten as he sanctifies. Now, I know that is a whole mouthful, but in order for you to have received the full understanding and the benefit from this session, you need to please pause the video and read and study the following scriptures before you, you continue. Uh, if you have not done so before with the, recommend, the recommendation that I've posted in uh, the explanation of what this video is all about. So I want you to take a moment and just read through and study and meditate on 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and then Romans chapter 6 and 7 and 8. So if you've not done so, please pause the video now and uh, first read through those chapters so you can get a complete picture as I'm going to refer to the different chapters as I release to you what I have on my heart today. Well, welcome back, and uh, let's continue. I want you, first of all, to look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3. It says there, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able. For you are still carnal, for where there are any strife and divisions amongst you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? You see, in the Acts of the Apostles, the strengthening work of the Spirit is in the foreground as the promised spirit of power. He therefore accordingly manifests himself for a bold and blessed testimony in the midst of all persecution and difficulties. In the epistle to the church at Rome, which was at that time the capital of the world, Paul was called by God to give a full and systematic exposition of the gospel of the kingdom and the scheme of redemption that is contained in it. In this, the work of the Holy Spirit has played a very important role and place. And Paul gives us his text or his theme in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It says there, 
For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He paved the way for what he was in the process to expel, that through faith, both righteousness and life would come. In the first part of his argument, up until verse 11, he teaches what the righteousness of faith is. He then proceeds from verse 12 to 21 to prove how this righteousness is rooted in our living connection with the second Adam and in a justification of life. And I really encourage you, if you've not done so before, go and read Romans 1 verse 11 up until 21. Then if you go to Romans 6, it speaks about the individual. You read verses 1 to 30. This life comes through the believing acceptance of the death of Christ to sin and his life to God as ours, and the willing surrender, there you read verse 14 to 23, to be servants of God and of his righteousness, and I'm still referring to Romans 6. Then he proceeds to show us that in Christ, we are not only dead to sin, but to the law as well, as the strength of the sin becomes naturally to the new law which his gospels bring, to take the place of the old, the law of the spirit of life. In Christ Jesus. We know how an impression is heightened by the force of when we look at contrast. Just as the apostle had contrasted in Romans 6, verse 13 to 23, the service of sin and of righteousness. So we see that he here in Romans 7, verse 4, contrast to bring out fully what the power and the work of the Spirit is, the service in the oldness of the letter in bondage to the law, with the service in the newness of the Spirit, in the liberty and power which Jesus, through the Spirit, gives to us. In the passages that follow, in Romans 7, verse 14 to 25, and Romans 8, verse 1 to 16, we have this contrast being worked out and explained. And it is in the light of that contrast alone that the two states of flesh and spirit versus carnality and the new life can be rightly understood. Each of these states has its keyword indicating the character of the life that it describes. In Romans 7, we have the word law 20 times and the word spirit only once. In the Romans 8, on the contrary, we find in its first 16 verses, the word spirit mentioned 16 times. And the contrast here we see is between the Christian life in its two possible states, in the law and in the spirit. And Paul had very boldly stated, not only you are dead to sin and made free from sin, that you might become servants unto the righteousness and to, and to God. But he also said, and that we see in Romans 6, but he also said in Romans 7 verse 6, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So we have here then a double advance on the teaching of Romans 6. There it was, the death to sin and the freedom from it. Here it is, death to the law and freedom from the law. There it was, newness of life, as an objective reality secured to us in Christ, here we see it is the newness of, of the Spirit. And let me just read that and emphasize that for you again. It says Romans 7 verse 6, But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve, listen, in the newness of the Spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter, as a subjective experience that is made ours by the indwelling of the Spirit. See, he that would fully know and enjoy the life in the Spirit must know what life in the law is and how to complete the freedom from that law is when we have been made free by the Spirit. 
in the description that Paul gives of the life of a believer that is still held in bondage of the law and then seeks to fulfill it, there are three expressions in which the characteristic marks of the, that state and condition are actually being summed up. The first, of course, is the flesh. In Romans 7 verse 14, it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Also Romans 7 verse 18, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. If we want to understand the word carnal, we must refer to the exposition of Paul in, it, in the verse that I've read right at the start in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3. He uses it here in the context of Christians who, though they've been regenerated, have not yielded themselves to the Spirit entirely, in order to become spiritual. They have the spirit, but they allow the flesh to prevail. So we see there is a difference between Christians as they bear their name carnal or spiritual from the element that is the strongest in them. So what am I saying? You're either a carnal Christian or you are a spiritual Christian that lives in the newness of life. As long as they have the spirit, but owing to whatever cause, they do not accept fully the mighty deliverance of the spirit. And as a result, they strive to live this life in their own strength. They do not and they cannot become spiritual as long they, as they live from that position. Paul here then describes the regenerate man as he is in himself. He lives by the spirit, but according to Galatians 5 verse 25, he does not walk by the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 25 tells us, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Remember Ezekiel 36 verse 26 that tells us, this new man has a new spirit within him. Uh, let me just read it to you. Ezekiel 36 verse 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. We see then that as a believer, man has not intelligently and practically accepted God's own spirit to dwell and to rule within his own spirit as the life, very life of his own life. He's still carnal and therefore lives a life of carnality. So we see that the first aspect is the flesh. The second is the will. That is the second expression that we find in Romans 7 verse 18 where it says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Find in every possible variety of expression, if you read Romans 7, verse 15 to, 20, um, to 21, Paul attempts to make clear this painful state of utter impotence in which the law and the effort to fulfill the law leaves a man. He says there, the good which I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I practice. You see, it's being willing, but not doing it, is the service of God in the oldness of the letter of the law, in the life before we experience Pentecost or the baptism of the Spirit in our lives. In Matthew 26, verse 41, it says, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see, the renewed spirit of the man has accepted, he has consented, he has surrendered to the will of God. But the secret of the power to do the spirit of God as indwelling has not yet become your reality. In those, in contrast, to know what the life of the spirit is, in life in the spirit is, God therefore then works both to will and to do. 
It is then that the believer then can testify and state, I can do all things in him that strengthens me. But this is only possible when we activate our faith through our faith and through the Holy Spirit. You see, as long as we as believers has not consciously been made free from the law with its continuous failure, we will hang on to our efforts to do the will of God. We may even delight in the law of God after the inward man, but the power to execute that is wanting. In Leviticus 18 verse 5, it says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. You see, it is only when you and I as man submits to the law of faith that states, which if a man does, he shall live by them, because he knows that he has been made free from the law, that he may be joined to the living Jesus, working in and through him by his Holy Spirit, so that he will indeed be able to bring forth fruit unto God. Romans 7 verse 4 tells us, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. So we see the first expression was flesh. The second expression is a surrendered will. And then it brings me to the third expression that we find in Romans 7 verse 23, which is captivity. Now let me just re read Romans 7 verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. You see, this word, captivity, as the other one, sold under sin, suggests to us the idea of slaves that are being sold into bondage without the liberty or the power to do as they would want to do. It refers to what Paul had stated in the commencement of the chapter that we've been made free from the law. One who is in captivity is evidently not one who does not even yet know that liberty and that freedom. This points towards the scripture that Paul has penned for us in Romans 8 verse 2 where he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The freedom with which we have been made free in Christ as offered to our faith cannot be fully accepted and experienced as long as there is a mindset of a legalistic spirit. It is only through the spirit of Christ within us that we can experience the full liberation liberation of that and it's being affected in our lives as it was in the oldness of the letter so it is in the newness of the spirit the twofold relationship exists the objective or external and the subjective or the personal we see there is a law over you and me and outside of me. there is a law of sin in my members deriving its strength from the objective one so being made free from the law, there is the objective liberty in Christ that is offered to my faith. And there is the subjective personal possession of that liberty in its fullness and its power to be received alone through the Spirit's dwelling and ruling in my members, even as the law of sin has done. You see, this alone can change the indictment of the captive. If we look at Romans 7 verse 25, Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he answers himself, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with a mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. The law of the Spirit has made me free. You see, now we have to regard these two conditions that are set before us in this chapter of Romans 7. If we look at 
Romans 7 verse 14 to 23 and Romans 7 1 to 16, we have to ask ourselves, is the con these two conditions, are they interchangeable or successive or is it simultaneous? Many believers have thought that they are a description of the var varying experiences that a believer can experience in his life. As often as by the grace of God he is able to do what is good and to live well pleasing to God, he experienced then also the grace of Romans 8, while the consciousness of sin and shortcoming plunges him again into the wretchedness of Romans 7. Though now the one and then the other experience may be more manifested, each day brings about the experience of both of these statuses. Others have felt that this is not the life of a believer as God would have it, and as the provision of God's grace has placed it within our reach, and as they saw that a life in the freedom with this, which Christ makes free when the Holy Spirit dwells within us, it is within our reach, and as they entered on it, it was to them indeed as if now forever they had left the experience of Romans 7 far behind, and they cannot but look upon it as Israel's wilderness life, a life never more to be returned to. And there are many we can testify what light and blessing has come to them as they saw the blessed concision was from the bondage of the law to the liberty of the Spirit. However, guys, how large this measure of truth in this view might be, it does not fully satisfy our exegesis. The believer feels that there is not a day that he gets beyond the words, in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Even when he keeps himself most joyously in the will of God and strengthened not only to will but also to do, he knows that it is not he but by the grace of God that in me dwells no good. As a result, the believer comes to see that not the two experiences, but that the two conditions are simultaneous, and that even when his experience is most fully that of the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, making him free, he still bears about within him the body of sin and death. So the, 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 the man, the Adam in us is still very much part of us. The making free of the Spirit and the deliverance from the power of sin and the song of thanks to God is the continuous experience of the power of the endless life as it is maintained by the Spirit of Christ. As I am led of the Spirit, I am not under the law. Its spirit of bondage, its weakness through the flesh, and the sense of condemnation and righteousness it works are cast out of us by the liberty that we have of the Spirit. If there is one lesson that you and I as believers needs to learn, is we must enjoy the full indwelling of the Spirit. And that is the one that is taught in this passage with such force that the law, the flesh, and that self-effort are still utterly impotent in enabling us to serve God. It is the Spirit within taking the place of the law without that leads us into liberty, wherewith Christ has made us free. Remember the scripture, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Let us pray. Beloved Lord Jesus, we humbly ask you to reveal to us in great clarity the blessed secret of the life of the spirit. Teach us what it is to become dead to the law, so that our service unto you, O Lord, is no longer in the letter of the law. We are married to you, even unto yourself, as the one that has risen, through whom we bring forth fruit unto you, and glory unto you, our God, as we serve you in the newness of the Spirit. Lord Jesus, it is with deep shame that we confess the sin of our nature, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. 
We confess that we are carnal and sold under sin. But we do bless you, O Lord, that in answer to that cry, who shall deliver me from the body of death? You have taught us to respond and to answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. Lord Jesus, please teach us now to serve you in the newness and in the liberty, the ever fresh gladness of the spirit of life within us. Teach us, O oh Lord, to yield ourselves in large and wholehearted faith to the Holy Spirit that in our lives may indeed be the glorious liberty of being a son of God and in the power of an indwelling Savior working within us, both to will and to do, even as the Father has worked in Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that this is a difficult session to put your mind around this, and that is why I encourage you to revisit this, revisit this, revisit this, now, read those chapters, meditate on those chapters, study those chapters, so that once and for all you can grasp the fullness of what it is to live a life in the newness of the Spirit. God bless you as you meditate upon His Word, and I'm looking forward in meeting again with you in our next session. God bless, great grace and peace to you and to your family. We'll talk soon again.